Dear students, I start with the good news. You are supposed to know everything in anatomy by now. So in the past, last few lectures, you didn't hear any more details. But the goal of this lecture is to tidy up your knowledge. You have a lot of details in your mind, and these are just flying around in your head. The goal of this one, that we make uh, orders, tidy up this knowledge, describe systems, which is very useful for your data medical practice. During this uh, uh, period, I have four lectures, two of them on the autonomous nervous system, one of the somatomotoric and one of the somatosensory system. Let's start right now. Today, I start describing the autonomic nervous system. Uh, to put into the picture, uh, I just repeat the general uh, things on the neural re re regulations. We have two levels of neural reg regulations, the somatic and the autonomic. The somatic is voluntary, so we do what we want to, and apperceptive, we get to know what really we feel. We have parallel a so-called autonomic or visceral nervous system, which is a kind of service uh, function, uh, which uh, will uh, working for maintenance. We cannot modify that. We cannot modify the heart rhythm or uh, body temperature and so on. And we are not aware of the information based on which this system is working. Uh, this is what we name. The, uh, the, today I start with autonomic nervous system. What is the function? Briefly, this is uh, working for the homeostasis. What does it mean? Uh, we have to get a couple of physical and chemical parameters for a body to work uh, appropriately. Uh, it should be a standard temperature, the body temperature, pH, ion concentration, and concentration of many, many other chemicals, and including the blood pressure and whatever. Uh, the uh, function of the autonomic nervous system is to make this standard stable. Uh, they work on a very simple principle, so you don't have to think about them to decide what will be our body temperature. It's set. What is the optimal pH? It's set. They must just have to ensure that this is sta stable. Uh, this is involuntary. It's very good, for, especially for the layman, not to tinkle with the heart rhythm or the blood pressure. It would be very tragic. Uh, and also, they are not aware of the information, a very large variety of information which is available uh, in our body to use for this control. In our brain, there is a very exact information on the blood pressure, body temperature, every point of the body, and so on and so on, glucose concentration. And this data would mean nothing for a layman, for the average people. For us, it's a pity because we wouldn't, we don't, didn't have to go, wouldn't, we wouldn't have to make any very expensive and slow laboratory analysis because the information is really present in our mind. The structure is very similar to the somatic, so we have five levels. We have receptors, which are picking up information from the environment, the autonomic, the internal environment. We have pathways, which carry this information into the center. This is what we mean the afferent pathways. In the center, we are processing this information, and we decide what to do, how to um, uh, react to these uh, changes of the information. Uh, this is the efferent uh, pathways, which carry out the information, and we have effectors, target organs. Uh, interesting, it's also philosophically uh, uh, interesting, that we have only three tissues among the uh, couple of hundred, which can be controlled directly by the central nervous system. These are the skeletal muscle, which is the voluntary, uh, only voluntary target. Uh, we have the smooth muscle and the glands. Any other tissue cannot directly control by the nervous system. Uh, the, uh, auto, uh, the somatic system controls the skeletal muscle. The other two tissues I mentioned controlled by the autonomic system. One interesting feature difference between these two systems is that in the efferent pathways, we have a, a nerve cells built in, in the form of the ganglion in the autonomic, which has a direct pathways in the somatic system. In the next chapter, I will describe the general features of the autonomic nervous system, let that be sympathetic, parasympathetic, or whatever. 
uh, we're going through these steps. The receptors, we have a large variety. They can measure, they can collect exact data on physical parameters like temperature, pressure, pH, osmotic concentration, and whatever, and chemical, oxygen concentration, glucose concentration, and so on. These receptors are relatively simple in structure. Actually, very little now on them, uh, just a very few information we have. And they're located in the wall of the organs and wall of the vessels. Some of them in the brain, especially the chemoreceptors, which measure the content or chemical composition of the blood. The afferent uh, pathways, very similar to uh, that of the uh, somatic. Uh, these have thin axons and small pseudounipolar nerve cells in the peripheral sensory ganglia. Uh, the uh, inf information you have to know is that the pathway of the afferent and efferent pathway of the same organ can differ, can work differently. So if we see the motoric, autonomic motoric pathway, autonomic motoric nerves for a certain organ, not necessarily the same way the sensory pathway goes back. This is why we have a different location of the visceral head zones, of which I will talk about later on with the somatosensory uh, piece of the lecture. The center of the autonomic system is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is the higher most center, it's the brain of the autonomic system, not only the neural, but also the endocrine system. So whatever uh, working for maintenance of our homeostasis, all of them is, uh, has a center in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus contains a couple of nuclei, not too many, and these nuclei do practically everything. Uh, Interestingly, if you, in, during your medical studies, in many subjects you hear about the hypothalamus. And apparently, whatever the lecturers say, different. Uh, for instance, in anatomy, uh, where we, in the anatomy department, we traditionally had a lot of uh, scientific data we collected on the neural control of the endocrine system very large percentage of, the, of these data in the science right now come from our department. We stress on the lecture, uh, this one. So you might have an impression that the hypothalamus is primarily controls the endocrine system. If you go to physiology, the scientific uh, uh, field is the uh, uh, appetite, appetite control. You think that the hypothalamus is a, a primary function is controlling the appetite. Uh, the, in the third year, in the uh, pathophysiology, this department works with the control of the body temperature. It also talks about the hypothalamus is a control of the body temperature. All of them are right. Any kind of homeostatic centrum is in the uh, hypothalamus, and the same nuclei can do controlling the appetite, controlling the body, uh, body temperature, uh, the uh, endocrine function, and so on and so on. Uh, from the center, uh, they, uh, the information must go to the periphery, uh, must do whatever they carry out, the signal. Uh, the first thing is to find a way to the last neurons, which is still inside the central nervous system. Uh, and this is what we name the autonomic nuclei. The pathways are the efferent pathway, and this is what we name the so-called supranuclear pathways, so before, above the autonomic nucleus. Once again, nucleus is a group of nerve cells, which is the last in this set, the axons of which go away to the periphery. Uh, the pathway is the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, the Schütz pathway. Uh, uh, many books doesn't mention that, but it's really worth mentioning. Uh, this pathway is just in front of the rubrospinal pathway, the lateral funiculus of the spinal cord. This pathway passes through the brainstem and all along the spinal cord, and they will uh, control both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nuclei in the brainstem and in the spinal cord. Uh, the autonomic nuclei, once again, these, uh, these uh, nerve cell groups, which is the last one in the central nervous system, after that will be peripheral, is the autonomic nuclei. They are located in a different point, so depending on whether they are sympathetic or parasympathetic or enteral, they are in different locations. So I will describe them with, when I describe the specific uh, part of the autonomic system. Uh, 
from the, uh, uh, the atomic nuclei, the information goes out, and these fibers we named the preganglionic fibers. As uh, I mentioned, as, as you know it, the specificity of the autonomic motoric system in contrast to the somatic is that in the periphery we always have a neuron in which a signal processing happening and a group of these peripheral neurons, namely ganglia, the autonomic ganglia, and these fibers from the autonomic nucleus end up in the autonomic ganglia and these fibers named the preganglionic fibers. The preganglionic fiber has the same structure as most of the peripheral nerves. So we have Schwann and myelin sheets around. This axon, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this is very thin, and the, the thinnest uh, uh, fibers are uh, these. Uh, the, uh, uh, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Doesn't matter whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic. The preganglionic fibers always work with acetylcholine. The ganglia, uh, which are the, the uh, peripheral nerve cells in this system, are multipolar neurons. Multipolar neurons have synapses on them, so this is a signal processing. Unlike the sensory ganglion, in which the pericardion is just a kitchen, just feeding the axon, do not involve in the signal product, uh, uh, processing, these cells process the signal, and uh, they are, I would say, a clever type of ganglion. Uh, where the ganglion are also system specific. I will describe them later on with the systems. The postganglion fibers are special. Unlike all the other peripheral nerves, they have no myelin sheath. The axon just pushed in the cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. Practically, they are not in contact with the cytoplasm, but the membrane push in with a little doublet. This is what we named the mesaxon. And one of the advantages of the system is that uh, not only one, but many axons can, be, can have a room in a single Schwann cell. So it's l certain economic, it's economical. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the advantage of this type of uh, Schwann cell only uh, uh, sheet is that whenever the axon is in, it can go out because it's simple getting the base axon shorter. And whenever it goes out, it can make a synapsis. Then the same axon steps back again, go further on, go out again, and make a synapsis uh, and other cells, and so on. This way, a single axon, many, many target, can, can control many, many target, uh, relatively far away from each other, and this can be undone this. If the membrane were wrapped around it, they couldn't do that. This type of synapsis system is named the collective nerve endings. Uh, the uh, transmitter of the postganglion fibers is, depends on the system for the parasympathetic acetylcholine, sympathetic norepinephrine, and the enteral is nitric oxide. Also, they have different location, uh, localization. The effectors are two type of tissue can be controlled by the autonomic uh, uh, different fibers, smooth muscle and gland. Cardiac muscle basically cannot be controlled by that. We have a few cells, specialized cells, like the sinoatrial node, which can pick up signal from this nervous system, but the usually normal, standard uh, uh, cardiac muscle cells are not innervated. They get the information through the gap junctions from the neighborhood. Uh, we all, similarly to the uh, somatic, we have also an autonomic reflex arch. Very briefly, let's imagine this is a gut, and there is an excess tension in the wall. This information goes into the sensory fibers, through the pseudo-unipolar cells in the spinal ganglion, and after the processing, the information goes out, and this information through the ganglion will innervate the muscles. The muscle will contract and reducing this pressure. This is a very simple, straightforward reflex arch. Uh, how can we classify? The autonomic uh, the efferent system can be divided in three groups. The afferent, the sensory part, practically we cannot divide, it's very identical, uh, but the efferent has different. We have a distinguished sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteral nervous system. In the followings, I will uh, describe the specificity of these three stems, starting with the sympathetic system. Well, let's talk about sympathetic system. If you hear about sympathetic system based on your middle school studies, the first thing you th think of is a kind of stress, stress reaction, aggressivity, or sometimes fear. Well, 
Practically, that's all true. So this is uh, uh, all those organs are activated by the sympathetic nerve fibers, which is necessary for activating our body, alarming, or also giving a stress response. But uh, you get closer to the reality if you think a little bit different way. These organs, which are innervated by, which are activated by the sympathetic nervous system, are those what we need whenever our environment is active. Whenever we, our environment is active, we have to take care what's happening. There are two possibilities. Either we, uh, uh, we can defend ourselves because there is a danger. Some, uh, something is dangerous for us. And uh, the other possibility that we are not in danger, but we find an opportunity, but we can, can make gain of it, uh, either physically, so some attack something or somebody, or any kind of advantage. Uh, so important thing is, doesn't matter what makes the environment active. We must be active because either we have to defend ourselves or we can use the possibility, a kind of opportunity. Uh, these organs, which are involved in both the defense and the attack, act attack named the, uh, the followings. First of all, a couple of organs has the circulation increase, especially the brain. We have to be more uh, active uh, of the brain. The heart must get more blood for the body. And the muscles, because most of the uh, functions, both defending and the attack, is based on contraction of skeletal muscles. Uh, especially the sweat glands are activated on that. Uh, these make two things. Number one is cooling. Whenever we do a kind of intense uh, uh, activity, we produce heat. And this heat must be uh, let out because otherwise we overheat it. And this uh, sweat gland will cool uh, our system, it's a like cooling function. Also, uh, sometimes locally, this is also a stressful condition, when something burns or something, a kind of caustic agent, uh, acid or alkaline there, we have, have to rinse it, have to wash it off. Uh, the pupils are uh, dilated. This way, more uh, light goes to our eye and we can more uh, intensely watch the environment. And also, the bronchi dilated, we get easier air and we get more oxygen for the work. Uh, the sphincters are closed. You, you can imagine that if you open sphincters, we had problems during a fight. And uh, the liver uh, makes glu uh, glucogen glucogenesis, uh, which uh, increases the glucose in the blood because all of this activity requires energy, and the energy fuel in our uh, body is the glucose. Uh, the uh, sympathetic uh, uh, nervous system, let's see uh, what's the difference between the sympathetic nervous system and the other, type, other subtypes of the autonomic nervous system. The center and the supranuclear pathway is identical. The first different thing is the nucleus. Where is the nucleus? The last cells in the central nervous system are located. This is located only in the specific segment of the spinal cord from the first thoracic till the middle lumbar segments. Nowhere else, no uh, sympathetic nucleus in the cervical part or the brainstem or the lumbar, uh, lower lumbar sacral part. The, in the spinal cord, they are located in the gray matter, in the lateral horn of the gray matter. Uh, this is practically ma ma making a continuous column of which segmentally within the inter, uh, inter uh, the, the spinal nerves they get out. Uh, the, the, whenever from the autonomic nucleus the information goes out, it goes with the anterior ramus, ventral ramus of the spinal nerve, in which case the thoracic region is also named intercostal nerve. Uh, it's, it's interestingly enough, and this is you have to remember because some of the books shows in a bad way, uh, the uh, preganglion fibers passes behind the sympathetic trunk, and then, as if you change the mind, they turn back and going back and supply that. After that point, uh, in the uh, uh, intercostal nerve, there is no preganglic autonomic fibers. This connection between the intercostal nerve and the uh, 
uh, uh, sympathetic trunk named white communicating branch, Ramus communicans albus. Here we can see a magnified picture. Here we have the vertebrae, these are the ribs, and between the ribs we have the intercostal artery, the intercostal nerve in, in the background, and the intercostal vein. From the intercostal nerve, which is here, the white communicating branch, the usually very nice bisectable way, go to the ganglion. With a little smaller magnification and better overview, you can see the sympathetic ganglion here. Sympathetic uh, 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 chain of the sympathetic ganglia, and this is the, uh, 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 these ganglion are located in the sympathetic trunk. Here you can see, this is the intervertebral foramen, so here we have the uh, intervert uh, intercostal nerve, from which the white communicating branch enter there. Uh, what happens there? Uh, this is uh, uh, either make a synapses in the ganglion, in this enlargement has cell bodies, these are ganglia, and only just a few percent of the fibers does that. Most of them, they are going away, either upwards or downwards, in the, uh, the sympathetic trunk. Sympathetic trunk, which is a series of ganglia connected with nerve fibers, the collecting nerve fibers is always pre-ganglionic fibers, not post-ganglionic. Whenever information, whenever uh, 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 nerve fibers is switched, made the synapse in the ganglion, the axons of these cells immediately go out in form of the gray communicating branch, Ramus conicus grisos, and they join the arteries. Uh, here you also can see this is the intercostal artery, and very nicely the uh, gray communicating branch joined that. The reason for that will be explained later on. The ganglia is always near the arteries because there is a general rule in the sympathetic nervous system that the postganglionic fibers always running in the adventitia of the arteries. The postganglionic fibers, as you know, they have Schwann only uh, uh, sheath. If you, uh, Schwann and Meyer is much stronger because there are several layers of membranes, which gives me a certain rigidity, toughness of the fiber. When we have only Schwann cells, it's very fragile, very easy to break. This is, these uh, autonomic postgonic fibers never form an own nerve, but they always need the help to run. The sim most of the sympathetic nerve fibers, the overwhelming uh, majority run in the arteries. This is why the ganglia is always located in contact with the arteries and the postgonic fibers immediately join the arteries. And the, the, uh, the, uh, these ganglia uh, are in the, forming the sympathetic trunk, uh, this is called along the so-called paravertebral spaces. The ganglia is located at the level of the intercostal or the lumbar lumbar arteries. And in the prevertebral ganglia, the ampere, which is the midline of the abdomen, uh, these, these are around the origin of the three abdo uh, unpaired abdominal branches of the, uh, 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 the visceral branches of the abdominal aorta. These are the celiac, the superior mesenteric and superior, uh, inferior mesenteric arteries, or the ganglia has the same name. Uh, the postgonglionic fibers, as I mentioned, always in the adventitia of the arteries. So if you can see this preparation, it's at, at first thing it's ugly looking, but all of these fibers are sympathetic postgonglionic fibers in the wall of the, in this case, the abdominal aorta. And if you make a preparation of the uh, arteries, uh, in which not only the fat, well, only the fat is removed, the nerves fibers remain, you can see a similar picture. The transmitter of the postgonic fibers is norepinephrine, which is specific for the sympathetic system. The effectors are smooth muscle. Most of the fibers end on the arteries. In the hair, on the hair, we have the musculus arrector pili. Whenever the hair is just straightened up in our back, whenever we are angry or uh, fearing, this is the background of that. The pupil, uh, dilatator pupillae, the uh, two, two group of glands, the sweat gland, and also the pineal gland are uh, controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. In the following, I start describing the structure of the sympathetic trunk. 
The sympathetic trunk, as I mentioned a couple, a couple of times, is a series of ganglion on the two sides of the vertebral column, connected by nerve fibers. Once again, all of the uh, connection between the ganglia is always preganglionic fibers. We have a total of 20 to 23 pairs of uh, ganglia. It depends on uh, the sacral ganglia, which can be shorter or longer. It is an individual variation. Uh, the uh, 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 sympathetic trunk picks up the information from the autonomic nucleus through the white communicating branch, as you saw in the previous pictures, and uh, these are the incoming fibers. The trunk itself, uh, once again, is the chain of ganglia, which uh, the connection is always preganglionic fibers. These preganglionic fibers going up the upper part of the cervical ganglia. In the cervical area, we have three ganglia, very important ganglia, but because of the cervical segment, we have no sympathetic nucleus in the spinal cord. The preganglion fibers much go from down to up, and uh, this is uh, uh, the, these uh, fibers coming from the upper thoracic uh, part. Uh, some of the fibers go medially in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, thoracic area. This is what we name the splunging nerve. Usually, but uh, not always, we have two of them, a bigger and a smaller one, major and minor splunging nerve. And uh, these, uh, the thoracic splunging nerve supply the cilia ganglion and uh, partially the superior mesenteric but the majority of the superior mesenteric and the total inferior mesenteric ganglia gets similar nerve cells going medially from the sympathetic trunk, and this is what we named the splunknic, lumbar splunknic nerves. Uh, also, we have the ongoing fibers, because at, at the middle uh, lumbar region, this is the last white communicating branch. After that, uh, the preganglion fibers must go down from the lumbar area, and the lower lumbar and all the sacral uh, sympathetic ganglia are fed by these downgoing preganglionic fibers. The gray communicating branch, Ramus conicans grisus, is what, as I mentioned, is a hidden, more medially located, short, thin, hardly dissectable structure which joins the intercostal arteries and with the intercostal arteries go further away or in the lumbar region, lumbar arteries or going medially for all the other arteries. The uh, postgonic fibers as I mentioned in that. Now let's see some details. This was the general uh, idea, general description of the sympathetic trunk. Let's see some details. As I mentioned, in the cervical part, we have three ganglia, which gets the preganglionic fibers from the uh, thoracic area. Uh, because uh, especially the superior cervical ganglion has a very sophisticated function with large number of cells, the feeding, the uh, controlling cells, which are located in the first two, three thoracic segment of the spinal cord, they are larger. The, uh, the lateral horn of the spinal cord is the thickest, the largest, at the upper thoracic segment. This is what we name centrum spilio, cilio spinale. Spinale refers for the spinal cord, cilio for the eye, for the pupil, because the very first they noticed if they uh, tinkle with this nucleus, uh, the uh, pupil uh, dilatation will change. The, uh, the ganglion itself is located behind the uh, carotid bifurcation. In this picture, uh, for the, the uh, cadaver, you can see this is the common carotid artery, this is the external, internal, sorry, and this is the external carotid artery with branches. And if you pull it aside, behind the bifurcation, you can see this big flat structure continues with a narrower one. This is the superior cervical ganglion, and this is the sympathetic trunk, which goes further more up. So this is the uppermost part. This is at the level of the hyoid bone, or at the level of the bifurcation of the carotid artery. The postgonic fibers join the, uh, uh, both the external and the internal carotid artery. Whatever is in the internal carotid artery controls the blood supply of the brain, uh, the pupil, the uh, pineal gland, and so on. And whatever is the external one, it controls the blood supply of the face. So the pupil, the eye muscles, eyelid, brain artery, spinal glands, salivary glands, and 
the partial the heart. There are some fibers which are going down to the heart, which will control the, the coronary arteries, and this is what controls the blood supply and consequentially the strength of the heart. Uh, the salivary glands uh, uh, in a sympathetic innervation is practically uh, due to the blood supply. If the arteries around the uh, salivary glands dilatate, they get more blood, they do not function more, they do not produce more enzymes, but through, during the transudation they produce a lot of liquid, so they produce thin saliva. This is sometimes uh, used for stress reaction. You can study it if you get a piece of lemon put into your tongue, you can see, if you see it, that how the parotid duct has a spray of uh, saliva. <laughs> the, uh, if we have a compression of the sympathetic trunk in the upper part, like tubor or any other thing, uh, the uh, sympathetic ganglion will not function uh, properly. And just having a look at the eye, you can uh, see it. In the eye, we have three symptoms, and this is what we summarize as Horner trias. If you really want to be a medical doctor, you have to notice clear difference between the three, uh, these two eyes. This eye is considered to be normal, this specific individual, and these, this eye has three differences. First of all, the upper palpebra is lower. It's hanging around. This is what we named the ptosis. The reason for that is that the superior, levator palpebra superior, uh, which is, uh, uh, has a tone, sympathetic tone to lift up, when the sympathetic tone is uh, uh, getting out because the superior cervical ganglion is not working properly, it will hang down. The other one is a meiosis. You must notice a difference between the size of the pupil. This relatively small difference has an important diagnostic value. So if you become a doctor, you have to be sensitive to these uh, differences. The uh, third one is the anophthalmus. This eye looks uh, smaller than the other eye. The reason for that because this eye is more behind. The muscles which moving the eye has a certain tone which pushing the eye a little bit outside normally. Whenever the tone of these muscles reduce, the eye going back and it looks apparently smaller. This is what we named an ophthalmus. The middle cervical ganglion is behind the uh, arteries which supply the neck, and this is the uh, thyrocervical trunk. The branches of the cervical trunk is responsible for supplying most of the neck. Uh, consequently, this ganglion, which is located here somewhere in nearby, they uh, will uh, go into the postgonic fibers along this artery and they control the blood supply of this neck. Also, we have uh, nerve fibers going to the coronary arteries. These are the middle cardiac uh, uh, nerve. Finally, the lowermost. Uh, cervical ganglion usually fused with the first thoracic making a large, very large ganglion with many many uh, uh, fibers. This is what we use, looks like a star. This is what we, na we named ganglion stellatum. You know stella is Latin for star. The star-shaped ganglion is located just behind the subclavian artery and as you know the subclavian artery is the main supplier of the upper limb. This uh, one you can draw the conclusion that they will primary supply the uh, control the blood supply of the upper limb. Here you can see this is the subclavian artery, this is uh, already a downgoing internothoracic artery, and here somewhere we have the, uh, uh, the stellate ganglion. Uh, also we have uh, fibers to the heart, sorry it's inferior, the inferior cardiac rami. Uh, we have a uh, Practically not really important, but some of the examiners like to hear that, the ansa subclavia. The important thing is that between the ganglia, not a single nerve cells, but we have a couple of nerve fibers going. In this, between the middle and the inferior cervical ganglion, some of the fibers went in front of the subclavian artery, some of them back. During the development, the subclavian artery went lower and lower in position, so the anterior rama make a, pull a loop and making a loop around. So between the middle and the inferior one, there is a loop. This is what we named Anza subclavia. I think it now has no practical significance, but some of the examiners like to hear that. This is why I mentioned that. Uh, this is what I wanted to talk about today. 
with the next lecture, I continue describing the sympathetic trunk. Thank you very much for your attention.